Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. Thursday here at the moment. This is uh, actually Thursday's episode for Patreon members and Friday for everyone else. So it's a little bit late. Uh, that's my fault. But the good news is um, Steve is here. Hi, Steve. Hello, mate. How are you going? Everybody wants to know where you've been. They've been asking me on Instagram. They've been saying, where's Steve? Is he coming back? And I said, yes, he is. Where am I? I'm, I haven't been anywhere. The lockdown has ended in Sydney, but um, I don't know if that really makes... Uh, I shouldn't say that. I, I haven't been out much since um, lockdown kind of ended. Um, it's pretty obvious that um, case numbers will kind of go up and all that sort of stuff. I've got two little kids so and a very big um, family on my wife's sort of side of the family with lots of kids as well. So we have to be careful and um, we kind of are. So, yeah, you know. I just told um, everyone you were away making money. You know that, right? Because that's, that's kind of what you've been doing. Yeah, I heard that, but <laughs> no, not really. I've been working, but I haven't been making a hell of a lot of money. Um, I got a new job working with a startup startup company. I haven't told you this yet, but um, which is kind of interesting. I won't name names and hopefully none of them sort of listen to it. But um, yeah, it's a slightly different kind of approach when you work with somebody that obviously doesn't have a whole lot of budget. Startup um, always yeah. sounds like tech. It's like it's a tech company or it's they're making a new crypto coin or something, a token. Yeah, it's funny too, like, because some people kind of, you know, like in my line of business, which is semi-similar to yours, you know, like people kind of go to you, oh, a lot of experience with kind of like digital stuff, stuff like you're digital first type of person. I know it's because I'm older, like, you know, I've been in the industry, you know, probably 25 years now, um, albeit I started early. But it's like, mm, isn't the answer to that, like, isn't everything digital these days? Like, you know, if you've kind of been, if you've been uh, working for the last five, ten years, like everything is digitally led, like everything has a website or, yes. you know, that type of interface. So I think pretty much the answer to that is yes, but um, it's just funny. I don't know. Well, people have websites, but are websites really as important? I mean, unless you're an online shopping store, right? Are websites really as important as what they used to be? I don't think so. Mm, as they used to be? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I reckon from a professional point of view, they probably are, but I don't think um, I, think, I don't think sort of like the features and everything that do kind of appear on a website, like, sorry, websites are all the same because they're all kind of templated sort of thing. Like, you know, it's just a way of kind of getting some sort of information across. Um, as you sort of say, like if, it, if you're selling something, then it's slightly different, but um, if it's just an information kind of website, then yeah, I think gone are the days where people are kind of going, hey, I'll spend a hundred grand on a website um, because you can just build it in kind of WordPress or Squarespace or whatever. Well, because everything's so spontaneous, right? Everything's so instantaneous and everyone wants the information updated hmm. on a regular basis. And look, I'm not a big Twitter person. I never have been a big Twitter person. You know what I mean? Like I have hmm. a Twitter account, but hmm. I don't really do anything with it. And I've had it since I think, you know, when it came out. But, you know, when you hear people talk about Twitter, it is like that news feed thing, isn't it? It's almost like RSS feed. It's almost like news feed where people just get updated regularly. And the fact about websites is that even though there is templates and even though there is things to do, and we're about to update, you know, the company website. And yep. it's like, yep. but, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll do it. But, like, it's like, you know, I see the traffic and there's not a lot of traffic. And there's traffic when, when, when Expo's on and stuff like that and before Expo when we're, like, talking mm. to a new client, I see the traffic go up, but only by, like, yep. you know, 20s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, otherwise yeah. no yeah. one's going to it. Um, no. What, what Same amazing. mine. Like, the only reason why you get to my website is basically if you're um, – if you've been referred to um, – referred to me and you kind of want to sort of have a look at my work before you – like even bother kind of sending me an email or picking up the phone and trying to talk to me sort of thing. Um, it's credibility though, isn't it, Steve? It's credibility. It's almost like you have a website, oh, like you're, you're, a, yeah. you're a real business. <laughs> you know, it's still kind of a bit like that, a yeah, little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. It's like a Yellow Pages listing, like yeah. back in the old days kind of thing. If you're, yeah. in, the, if you're in the Yellow Pages, then you're a kind of proper kind of business sort of thing. Um, now, if you've kind of got a website, it's a bit like that too. But um, yeah, I don't know. And, and to a degree, like when, 
I'm not like a, I don't sort of provide websites for lots of people kind of thing, or I don't, like it's not my kind of core craft, but um, um, I do sort of think that if you've kind of got a dodgy looking website, like, well, I know when I look at it, I can kind of tell if you've kind of spent money or whether, like how slick or professional it is. And I do judge off the basis of that. Um, So, I don't know. It's it's like everything though, isn't it? There's good templates. There's good like, bases where you can start you know what i mean like you know you can mm. just get the you know the folder with all the other stuff in it where you can just build it yourself um or there's ones where you can actually yep. have a lot of customization i still think squarespace is a good one because it has a lot of customization i'm not a big fan of wordpress and word whatever it is um, i always find mm. those websites if they're not done properly they really don't work that well you see people that have used them and if they don't if they're not set up properly they really are like a pain in the ass to use yeah 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 But the problem is everyone thinks they're a web designer, like you said, but no one knows, you know, interface design and UI and stuff and like how it all works and then the flow is not easy to do. You know what I mean? And if you don't know that, it doesn't matter how good your template is, you still are going to have something that's not really that great. And I think you notice it on on some of these websites that are made from templates that they're not really, they don't have that flow, you know what I mean? Which is a bit weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you lose people's interest kind of pretty quickly, like we're doing right now. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, everyone would think that me and Steve have been chatting every day since uh, since we last uh, since Steve was last here, which was uh, just before I went to Dubai. We haven't been because we've both been really busy. So this is actually the first time we've actually spoken uh, at length, isn't it, Steve? We've actually been very quiet yeah, even on the mess. We've, we've both been heads up. down. Yeah, we've both been heads down. Um, so I'm just going to get straight into it because we're going to do a little slightly shorter one today. Um, because Steve has got to go and it's uh, I'm still half asleep because it's only 5.30 in the morning here. Porsche Cordona story. Steve, I know you probably didn't listen to it because you were no, busy. No, no, I did. Oh, I you did? did? So I, I did. wanted to ask you about that. I'm glad you listened to it. So we've got um, Paul from the UK. Um, yep. I had a good chat with Paul, a uh, nice guy, and uh, he's Rengineering at UK, at Rengineering UK, if you haven't been to his Instagram. He's got a YouTube channel. There's no videos on it yet, but there will be long-form videos about the project that he's doing. Uh, He's got a 2015 981 Cayman manual. I have to say that that manual Cayman, the base Cayman, is is kind of an appealing little car, isn't it? Um, I don't say little car. I mean appealing Porsche to own. I I do Mm. actually like the look of it, and I do think they're very – I still think – I think they're very cool. Um, They really – are still quite expensive though in Australia, aren't they? They're not. They haven't really gone down that much in price. I don't think any Porsche is kind of cheap. But yeah, <laughs> no, you're sort of saying like um, they're cool little cars. Yeah, and his has got a. His had a really. Um, his has pretty good options. So and it looks. It looks really really cool. I like how it looks. And he's been driving it a lot. And it's, it was a great story. It was good. To, it was good to chat with Paul. Um, Paul reached out to me. At first, Paul reached out to me, and I know he's listening. Um, hi, Paul. Um, and he reached out to me about his project that he's doing with um, his two partners. And his two partners, and I know Paul's like cringing now because he thinks I'm going to mention who they are. I'm not going to mention who they are, but they're actually um, well-established people in the design industry. Um, That's all I'm going to say. Um, They're well-established people. They're not necessarily famous people, but they work for well-established companies and they're very talented people um, in jobs that everyone will be going, wow, I wish I had that job. Um, So that side of it is very cool. And Paul's an engineer himself. Um, but I think it's a really good story. I think his car story is a good story. That story, Steve, he, you know, where he drew mm. the 993 engine and silhouette and then sent it to Dick Lovett. I love that dealership. You know, it's like when Paul said to me, I know Dick Lovett, it's like, I know it because that name is so, you know, how could you forget oh, that name? Didn't Edward Lovett set up um, collecting cars, right? Oh, is that Edward um, Lovett? son of. Ah, oh, really? Yeah, family ah, business. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. How would I not know that? That's yep. the same name. Yep. I noticed on Spike he's stopping. He's he's started to stop saying that Chris Harris is collecting cars. He says Chris Harris does the videos for collecting cars. Now he doesn't say Chris Harris is collecting cars. Does he own a share in the business? He must do. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Edward Lovett seems like a Edward Lovett seems like a nice guy. He's a guy that has a, he has a singer. We used to have a singer. Um, and I remember in Instagram yep. when I first started Porsche Cooled, I used to repost it and he used to say thanks and whatever. Like he, this is before collecting cars was even around. Because um, he has that blue, I don't like I said, I don't know whether he still has it, the blue singer. And there was a video of him like... He said he sold it, didn't he? Did he sell it? Yeah, there's a video of him like slamming it, yeah. slamming it off the line in uh, Mayfair, in um, Mount Street in Mayfair, where he takes off from that front of that really famous cafe that's in Mayfair. It's a very, it was a very cool car. It was a very cool car. 
Ah, so that's his father. It all makes sense now. I think so. Like, def- the, the, the Lovitz are definitely like that kind of family kind of business connection. I don't know if um, Dick Lovett is his dad or whatever, but um, there's obviously a connection in there somewhere. Yeah, so Paul's story, he, he sent those images in. He drew the 993, he drew the engine, Steve, he drew the silhouette, and then he sent it into Dick Lovett, and then Dick Lovett sent him a whole lot of books, I think Porsche books and other books, uh, for, his, you know, for his school, for his passion. Um, and then he was fascinated by Porsche, um, like all of us, out of reach. Um, one day, as we always say, one day we'll get a Porsche, and one day he has, and he's got his Cayman, and he's really, really happy. And then he's doing, but he's had some cool cars, though. He had that Mark I MR2 which he had mm-hmm. done by Power Station, which is part of Litchfield. Um, he had Accord Type R's, and then he had the Lotus Elise, which I'm still really keen on. I keep saying that. I think I think you or I should get an Elise one day and just use it as a track car. <laughs> That'll be you, mate, then. Don't look at me. Why? You've got money. We can do, we can do a Plan Z. I have, we can do a Plan I have S. zero money. Plan S. I have absolute fuck all money, so yes. <laughs> um, but, like, no, I always like the look of them. Um, Elise, kind of wonder with whether whether um, they're hard to maintain. Like um, the the short bit, little bits and pieces that I have kind of seen and um, on YouTube about them and stuff like that is that if they have any sort of damage, the chassis is incredibly hard to kind of look after because it's um, an extruded aluminium kind of thing. So, no, I was going to say what I was saying. How we just dropped out, but what I was going to what I was saying is, isn't there an issue when they're with cars and with other things where two different types of materials are match together and there's always some kind of issue where they where they join oh okay um not I'm too technical for me i have no idea but yeah. i don't know i read about it somewhere i think i know what you're talking about um but anyway paul is paul is engineering um he's got two partners um you should follow this project it's going to be a pretty cool project like i said he's going to do long form videos they're going to be on youtube um basically he's getting uh <clears throat> graduates, STEM graduates together. He's going to pick some. He's going to uh, reach out to them um, and use their skills, and he's going to re-engineer the whole platform of a 550 Spider. He wants it to be like singer quality. He wants it to be like carbon carbon body. You know, he wants to like, you know, uh, re-engineer some of the parts, um, and then it's going to be sold on collecting cars once it's all done. Um, I think it's a really good, I think it's a really good non-profit idea. I think it's a really good idea to help these graduates with their skills that they you know like he said you know he's i think it was his nephew or friends or friend's son or whatever that couldn't get a job so it's all about you know helping these guys when they come out of their their studies to actually um work on a on a really cool project and it's going to be a you know a 550 spider a 50s 550 spider um as he said there's lots of kit cars around steve lots of kit cars around um and he wants to differentiate this from the others by making it um special you know what i mean so i think it's a good project. What do you think? I don't know much about 550s apart from the fact they look kind of cool. Um, kind of curious as to like how they drive and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's cool. But the project um, itself is pretty cool. Yeah. I want, like how hard is it these days? I've noticed like on Instagram, they kind of serve me up um, ads for places that um, send you kind of kids to lay your own kind of uh, carbon fibre down like make your own kind of molds. I'm assuming really? it's sort of like lots of sheets with like the epoxy and stuff like that. <laughs> you can see what you've so, been Google searching. <laughs> Whatever you Google search. Like yesterday yeah, yeah, yeah. I was searching Abu Dhabi, right? Because I'm thinking about going yeah. back to Dubai, going back to Expo for a couple of days and then I'm gonna, we're going to drive to Abu Dhabi and go to the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, the art gallery there right. um, in the next couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden on Instagram we're getting ads for Abu Dhabi. It's like that was yeah. quick. That was just like an hour ago. <laughs> Well, Zuckerberg's out there and um, Google Google's watching your every move. But, yeah, yeah, like um, uh, it did kind of make me wonder, like, ah, oh, man, if they kind of – if if, um, if carbon fibre has become that common and they're sort of sending you, sending you like, do-it-yourself kind of kits where you can kind of mould your own things and stuff like that, I'm sure it's kind of pretty shit-ass quality. But um, I wonder how hard it really is to kind of um, – you know, like back in the day, like carbon fiber was very exotic and it's a bit of a dark art. Yeah. Um, I wonder if in um, sort of industry these days, like it's just meh, you know, whatever kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. All right. So that's owner's stories this week. That's number 53, Steve. Um, next week, mm-hmm. we have another really good one coming up. And I should, 
I should just double check it is this person, but I'm pretty sure it is. Next week is number 54. Um, and next week is an owner who has uh, a car that someone else who's been on Owner's Stories used to own. So it's going to be quite an interesting one. Actually, two people on Owner's Stories used to um, own his car. So cool. that's going to be a really good one. Um, I'm just double checking now because I'm a bit half asleep and I'm just <laughs> double checking that it is next week before I announce it. Uh, let me just have, have a look. Have yeah, I've already recorded it. I've been I've been going yeah. a bit crazy with the owner stories. I've I've recorded. I'm recording another two people this weekend, um, or this week, uh, Friday and Saturday. I think I'm recording another two. So I've been recording people in advance. Um, I've had some really good really good chats. When I first got back from Dubai, I was I was recording quite a lot. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna announce it. So this week I've got Xander coming up, um, and some people will know who Xander is. Um, Xander is a Boys Own Garage in Adelaide. Uh, and Xander um, has just bought a car off someone else from Owner Stories. I'm not going to say who it is. You can work it out. And he's also uh, used to own another car that someone from Owner Stories bought and is getting uh, redone in Adelaide. Um, so it's it's a good story. It's sort of come full circle. So it's a good one, Steve. Uh, really nice guy. Had a great chat with him. Uh, went a bit long, but it's a good one. Um, no, uh, no Apple ratings and reviews this week. I just want to tell the listeners, Steve, uh, if you want us to get seen in the uh, charts, I tell you what, when we had that two weeks off, out the figures oh. just, they're just like the beast, the beast was hungry. It just, it just dropped. It just dropped. Like and then what happens? Tomorrow. So then when you start it back up again, is it, um, uh, it's is it big, hard to kind of get the momentum back or? No, it's, it's more than before, more than before. Okay. It's, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, everyone, there's been a lot of new listeners and Owner's Stories was, uh, the first owner Stories when we came back was about 20 or 30% more listeners than the one before, previously. Um, yeah, that good. day, that day, I should say, that downloads on that day. Yeah. So it's been good. It's been good, but they really do drop off when you, uh, when you stop recording, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, but right. Apple ratings and reviews gets us seen in the charts. Uh, we drop down quite low. We're very big in the Scandinavian countries, Steve. We're very big in Norway, uh, Sweden, um, those sort of countries. In those countries, they like us. And Norway, they uh, they all like us there, which is cool. Um, uh, Australian accent? Maybe. I don't know. We should ask John. John's listening. John, why do they like us in Norway? <laughs> yeah. John John is John was on owner stories with the GT3. If you if you wonder who I'm talking about. Um, okay, now that's about it. Uh, Apple ratings and reviews. Our Patreon. I usually do a shout out for the new Patreon members. There's no new Patreon members this week, um, but last week I did uh, say that uh, Sashin was a member of Patreon, and I must have been half asleep because I said I didn't know who he was. I do know who he was. So Sashin, thank you. Uh, Sashin has been, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Sashin has been um, communicating with me on Instagram. Uh, he moved out of London and he moved to the Cotswolds and he's, he's, uh, he's into Porsches big time. So um, I just wanted to mention that this week because I sort of made out like I didn't know who he was last week and I do actually know who he was. So I was a bit off the boil last week when I was uh, chatting to myself. <clears throat> so, Steve, insurance. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, it's funny because the timing of this was pretty much great. Uh, I had a lot of people reach out to me about it. I know you sent me that mm -hmm. thing saying... They don't look at car sales and stuff like that. They don't look at advertised with cars that are being advertised for value. Pretty sure um, they don't, but could um, be wrong. I think you're wrong. Um, and then, <laughs> and then I had people saying to me to go to Shannon's. Stephen in Sydney said Shannon's was really good. Someone else told me some other company, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but anyway, it. I thought that you know, I, I, the woman I deal with at Porsche Insurance, and I'm not going to mention her name. You know who she is. Mm -hmm. They take a little while to get back. I don't hassle them. I just left it. I think it took a week. Um, so I'm not sure where I left it last week. But basically, Steve, they asked me, she asked me for the odometer reading of my car. And she uh -huh. asked me for images of the exterior and interior. I didn't uh -huh. have current, obviously, exterior or interior shots. I gave them like two like really basic interior shots, which were just side on view from outside the car. And then I gave them, uh, you know, the, the shots that I've posted many times on Instagram, the older shots of the outside of the car, but the car looks the same anyway. Um, yes. And I sent I that to say, them. I'm not going to know the difference. No. And I sent that, well, it's got a, I guess if you go to command I on the file, you can see when the photo was taken, if you were smart enough. So I sent that, uh, this was in response to the fact that I sent, I saw uh, two or three 997 Carreras on car sales, the car side in Australia that people know of because we talk about it so much. 
Um, and they were, I think, 120. I think one was 100, two or 120 and one was 100. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't tell them what value I wanted my car insured at. I didn't actually say I mm-hmm. wanted 100 or I wanted 120. I just left it open. I just said I want to increase the value of my car. I think it's underinsured. Um, I sent them those links and then she came back and said, send me some images, send me the odometer for the underwriter. And then mm-hmm. she got back to me yesterday and she said those images really helped. They have now agreed to 120,000 value. Yeah, has your premium gone through the roof? Not really. Not really. It went up by, well, it's, it's, there is now uh, five months till my premium runs out. Yep. So five it months. was four months till my premium runs out. Sorry, four months. Wow, it, they're, they're really early to kind of send you a renewal. No, they didn't do me the renewal. It's not a renewal. It's an uplift. It's the extra cost for the extra insurance premium. Oh, did you reach out to them? You wanted to kind of lift, uh, this isn't part of a renewal process. This is like you kind of instigating a... No, no, no. Yeah, no, right. no, it's not the renewal. My renewal's in February. My insurance is renewed every February. Um, yep. I wasn't comfortable with my car only being valued at, you know, I'll be up front here, I don't care about hiding values. It's, it, was, it was only valued at 85, which I wasn't happy yep. with. Yep. When I first had, got the car, it was valued at 88, which is what I paid for it. It's, it's yep. valued at 85. It was valued at 85, but they wanted to value it at 80. I had to push them to 85. And that at that time in February this year, February 2021, they said there's no way in the world we can do it for any more than 85. So I just let it go because I had too many other things on my plate, you know, not being able to get home and having expo stuff in my head. But now I had a clear head when I came back from Dubai. I thought, no, I want this. I, I'm not comfortable with the car being underinsured. So I approached them. Yep. Um, there's four months until my insurance uh, is up for renewal. So I just had to pay the difference in the premium. Yep. And the difference in the premium was $120 Australian. So effectively prorated, that's like if you've 30, got four months and that's a third. $30 a month. Yep. Which is not much, which I'm actually okay with because it's gone up by $35,000. So I'm not actually, I'm not actually fussed by that. Yep. Um, and then the excess went up by $250 as well. They had to put the excess up, but my excess was really low, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, right. Um, I don't yeah, know what excess, same. but it's good. I'm happy about it. I'm really happy. Um, like I said, $30 a month. Um, I'm not going to say what my insurance costs, but you know, for $30 a month, it really doesn't, I'll tell you off, off recording, but it doesn't really make it. I'm happy with the price of it. I don't think it's that expensive. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, mm. And I'm one of these stupid... Same thing happened to me. Like, remember, I sort of raised it when kind of renewal time... Um, came up for me sort of thing that kind of instigated this a similar sort of thing where it's like oh it seems kind of undervalued um when they nominated a like a new agreed kind of price and i was with porsche insurance as well um so i kind of had a sort of similar-ish conversation with them it's interesting though though because i didn't tell them i wanted it at 120 they just decided 120 you know what i mean yeah i mean i sent them those cars on sale for 120 and then they gave me 120 um, but it just shows you, Steve, how much the market has shifted. Like it really, you know, it really has shifted. And last night I was looking at, you know, I went through and looked at 996 Turbos and Tiptronic because we're going to talk about that in a second from that article you saw. And I looked at 993s and Tiptronic thinking maybe those cars are cheaper. It's interesting, you know, like Tiptronics are not that much cheaper than manuals. They're not, it doesn't, really? seem, to be as, doesn't seem to be as big a gap. It doesn't seem to be as big a gap. There was a 993 Carrera in red Tiptronic, which was about 160K. Now, I guess the equivalent mm-hmm. manual might be 190K, but it's not a huge difference. It's not a huge difference. I was actually surprised. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, what was I was going to ask you, so uh, you said that you had like heaps of people kind of reaching out to you after you um, talked about insurance. Like what other companies... What other recommendations did you get apart from Shannon's? Uh, mainly there were Shannon's. There was one other one, but I can't remember. I'll have to have a look. Yeah, cool. Oh, I just, can't remember. Just curious. Just curious. Like I tried Shannon's like year after year kind of thing, um, and I've never actually kind of gone with them before. But I remember, I remember back in the day they were a bit, um, a bit prescriptive about like the conditions for it. I was wondering if that was sort of still the case. I remember I called them when I first got my car. And they yeah. were expensive. They were expensive. Yeah. They were more expensive than Porsche insurance. I rang NRMA uh, in Australia, yeah. which is an insurance company. People would know about it who live in Australia. I called yeah. uh, Porsche insurance because you told me. And I also called Shannon's. 
And yeah. I think NRMA was a, a hassle. There was a problem with NRMA. It wasn't easy for them. Um, but Shannon's was actually a lot, was more. And I called GIO actually, and GIO was really expensive. Yeah, I've also found that the big, like the big kind of common insurers, like NRMA, GIO, Suncorp, all that sort of stuff, um, they don't tend to touch um, Porsches anymore. They did like, you know, 20 years ago sort of thing, but um, more recently they get really kind of funny about it. So um, yeah, yeah. I've found it actually even hard to get a quote out of some of those um, places. NRMA, I think, kind of came back, but the other ones, um, I don't think you can get one through Allianz and stuff like that. But here's the question to you, and this is the question I was going to ask you. Now yeah. my car is insured at that value. Do you yeah. feel like you should actually up the insurance of your car? Because did you see the... Um, no. Did you see the 997 GT3 that was for sale? That I think James Silver Porsche Platts put it on Porsche Forums Australia because they advertised it at 297 and then it went up to 307 like a day yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I know. Uh, isn't that dude um, James from Auto Amateur had him on his um, uh, YouTube channel or podcast at one point in time and just Did had he? a sort of little chat with him? He's a guy that. Um, I remember it because it's very distinctive. It's kind of got the Krapovich, um, like the full kind of system plus those HRE wheels sort of right. thing. So I must have. I remember it. him. I remember him kind of talking about it um, for a bit. But um, no offense to the the guy, but I think he's kind of um, kidding himself at three hundred k. Like, I mean, oh, the cars are great and everything, but like they're getting that's getting well kind of crazy. I don't know, mate. He might sell it. I mean, look at the 996s. They're going. He might sell it. I'm serious. It yeah. seems like that 300, 300K is like, it's like become the, I don't know. It's scary. It's like that 275 to 300K seems to be the, the, the ballpark, which is very, very scary, but it, it seems to be It is there. scary because it wasn't that long ago, you know, like um, when, um, you know, like my mate who recently bought the GT3 like mine um, yeah. was in the market. And I remember distinctly sort of saying to my mates, like, oh, uh, you know, like I think you're in the ballpark of about, and I think at the time I sort of quoted to him like about 190 when he was looking at cars that were about 220, 230. But he must um, be happy. He must be happy because it's not, you know, the value's gone up so much in that short period of time. Yeah, I don't know. Like I spoke to, um, and I'm, I won't divulge the actual kind of prices, but I did have a chat to kind of Scott at Order House, and I know what they've kind of sold a couple of um uh, 997 GT3 is for, and I don't think it's at, it's not at the 300k level. Like it certainly is not nowhere near that. So um, that's why I kind of commonly sort of say like, I don't think you can necessarily kind of take the um, the advertised prices at the kind of selling price. Like I think there's still like a fair bit of um, there's a decent amount of kind of not slack, but it depend it it kind of depends on who it is because even like I know Auto House they don't they're of the mind where they don't kind of put a crazy price on it and then expect to kind of do a lot of argy-bargy with it. Um, but, but even if yeah. even if it's advertised at 280, 290, there's probably 10%, 7 to 10%. That's all you're going to get off. You're not going to get much more than that. If it's at a dealer, yeah, it's at, you know. I don't know. I, I guess it depends on the car. Like talk about that silver car, for example. Um, I haven't read the Porsche forum. I didn't see what um, James said about it, but I noticed that it did have like the optional sunroof where the <laughs> – the seller, um, the seller kind of uh, noted that as like a desirable kind of thing. And yeah. um, I remember that previous car that, you know, like we mentioned once before where um, the Porsche Forums guys kind of um, went a bit sort of feral on the fact that it had a sunroof and how you don't want a sunroof in a GT3. And like, like I sort of said that time too, it's like, I semi get it, but I just don't think I still don't think it would be a deal breaker. But you know, like mm -hmm. I'm not, um, I'm not in the market sort of thing. But I don't know, like in this silver cars instance, whether or not you'd pay extra for the fact that it's kind of got a sunroof is um, probably kind of unlikely. Yeah, yeah. Did you read that article I sent you? Um, oh, pain correction. Do you want to talk about that, or you have we have we done that to yeah, death? Can do. You finished? No. Yeah, so like um, I've been trying to kind of keep myself sane. I think I mentioned it the last time I was on the podcast um, that I'd sort of started. So just been slowly working my way through it. I think like um, most people kind of when they do it, they'll kind of disappear for like two or three straight days trying to do it because there's quite a few steps in it if you're trying to do like what's called a two-stage kind of correction. Um, 
but I was doing like a panel at a time because um, uh, I've, we've got little kids and all of that sort of stuff plus work, blah, blah, blah. So whenever I could, I'd kind of duck downstairs for like an hour or two and try to do like a panel at a time. Um, but I finally finished. Not bad. Like I, I kind of feel like I did quite a good job on the actual um, paint correction, which is... Um, to be specific is sort of where you're removing all the swirls out of the clear coat, right. um, which is the main thing of when you're using the kind of uh, machine polisher. No mistakes? So, mm, no, uh, not really. Like, it, you can't really make a mistake. Well, yeah, you I guess can you can, sorry. The, like, you can take the clear you coat can burn off, th- right? You can burn through the clear coat, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, I didn't burn through the clear coat, but um, I didn't chase that hard. Like, I did notice, for example, my rebumper for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure my rebumper is not original paint because um, when you look at it hard, it doesn't match particularly well. Right. Um, so I reckon that was a respray. Um, but that's normal, right? But, that's pretty normal on Porsches. Yeah. Uh, front and rebumpers, I think you can pretty much expect, like on most kind of, you know, more than 10-year-old cars um, will have probably had a paint job here and there. Yeah, which is not a big deal. Um, but I found that that was a lot harder to kind of get the swells out of, um, so I'd, I couldn't really get them. Um, you know, like this is, uh, I, I think one of the things when you kind of wind up going down this rabbit hole too is that, you know, you're tucked away in your kind of garage and you've got all your your lights set up. It's a very it's a very unnatural kind of way of looking at your car. Like it doesn't matter how fussy you are, right. you're never going to kind of put, spotlights on your car okay get down on your hands and knees and looking at on funny angles and stuff like that okay back up for a second when i did did you buy lights did you have big lights around you like studio lights? just one just one just one like cheap aldi ones or costco ones did people Um, look at you like you were weird or something when they're walking past? yeah yeah, of course of course people always look at me like i'm weird mate (laughs) but um how many hours did you put in uh, i reckon in total be close to 70 70 hours was it worth it oh actually no more than that it'd be more that would be for the correction itself and um, you said your uncle took it to a professional and got it done and it was a few grand or whatever it cost yeah how many hours two. how many hours did that take for the professional do you how long did your uncle leave it with the that guy for he left it with um he left it with elias can't remember the company name for two days but okay i don't know if it's comparable because like my uncle's car is a lot newer than mine so, and my uncle sort of said to me that he thought the paint was actually pretty in pretty good kind of condition when before he had it kind of corrected. So um, I think if I took my car to Elias, um, it probably would take longer than my uncle's. But I doubt, like a, I doubt, sorry, I doubt that a professional person would spend seventy hours on their car. So next time, would you car. get next time? Would you get someone? to do it or would you do it again yourself no 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 i do it i do it i do it myself like clearly it took a lot longer because i don't know what i'm doing i was learning as i was kind of going and don't forget um i didn't have a full-size machine as well um i had the pissy little kind of thing that's only like a three inch three and a half inch pad whereas a normal machine has like a six anywhere right. between five and seven inch pad okay so when you start these sort of projects you like you know yeah. you're stuck down in your garage you're halfway through and you go Oh, damn, I don't have all the materials. Did that happen? No. Oh, that's good. So you well planned. No. Yeah, but don't forget, again, like because I was doing it like a panel at a time, like, you know, because I was only spending like maybe two to three hours, like one session tops. So that would be like one panel at a time. Right. Um, like if you came, kind of came home to Sydney, I think it's the kind of thing that you would actually enjoy. I actually think that... um. You watch a few videos, you kind of get a few tips, you start talking to idiots like me or my uncle or whatever, um, and you'd prop, you'd probably kind of get into it. Um, yeah. But like I the, think like even I reckon if you kind of did it knowing how meticulous you are, I think you'd sort of be in the same thing where I don't think you'd – I reckon you'd spend longer than two days on it um, and um, you just kind of get stuck in this little hole kind of working on it. Um just to finish that off, though, like the one yes. thing that was a pity was like I spent 70 hours doing the paint correction and then right at the end of it, then once you kind of made your paint as clean and, you know, flawless as you possibly can, like you sort of chase it as much as you want. Yep. Um, 
you put the coating on top, obviously. Yep. Um, but the one that I bought requires, and I think most of them are like that, require two coats. Right. So you've got to, you know, put it on, uh, wipe it off, leave an hour, and then kind of put another one on. Um, I sort of thought maybe that might take about five hours or something like that. It took pretty much the full day and I was rushing it in the end. And I pretty much reckon that I put some scratches into it because I was rushing um, to kind of get the second coat on. So, so you have to do it all in one day. You have to do shit. it at once. Yeah, because it cures like it's a very... But you have to wait for the first layer to cure first to dry. You have to put a certain no. amount of time. So you have to decontaminate your car again. So you polish it all up. Um, you've got to make sure that you clean it again because you've got to take all like um, like all the kind of compounds and polishing kind of um, fluids have like an oil in it. So you've got to yeah. make sure you get that off because if you don't and then you try to apply a ceramic coat, it um, stops it from kind of bonding properly. Right. So you've got to wash your car. Then you apply your first coat, which is sort of like, you know, wiping it on and then kind of buffing it off quickly by hand. Um, right. You've got to wait an hour and then do it again. Um, right. And I know it sounds weird, but it, like it, even my uncle sort of said to me, oh, look, you know, if you're kind of quick about it, it'll probably sort of take you about five hours. But I think it wound up taking me almost the whole day. Wow, and that's like crazy. I said, that's I was crazy. rushing at the end. So I think I kind of slightly botched it at the end, um, which is a shame. For the listeners that are wanting to do this, you know, it's it's yes. a big it's a big job, right? But cost wise, do you think you is it the experience of doing it, or do you think you actually did save money from what you would have paid um, getting it done professionally? Um, I think you definitely save money. I don't think if you buy because you don't need to buy a super kind of stupid kind of crazy equipment. Like you can buy cheaper kind of polishes that are you know I think you can get a decent one for like three hundred Australian dollars. Um, but there's a lot of kind of pads and polishes and like sprays to kind of clean the surface off and microfiber towels and all of that sort of stuff and and lights like all of it's quite important I think um, so it does definitely kind of rack up um, in terms of cost. Isn't the um, um, ceramic coating stuff quite expensive though? Right, I remember for the yeah, wheels, the stuff for the wheels that I bought that was expensive. So I'm guessing for the whole car that's quite an expensive cost, quite a big cost. Yeah, I think sort of like between 150 to 300 for like 30 or 50 mils, which will probably do two cars. Oh, okay. Where, where it'll come into play is that if you do more than one car. So like if you buy all this equipment and like for me, if I kind of do my wife's car, if I um, muster up the courage and the, find the time to kind of do the McCann, then it will definitely kind of be worth it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Second time around, it's what makes it worth it. Cool. But yeah, look, it was a it was a way of kind of trying to survive lockdown as well, and just try to keep yeah. myself semi sane. So, I look forward yeah. to seeing it, mate. Hopefully, it's still clean. When hopefully it's still in the same condition when I get back, and you haven't got new scratches on mm, it. Should be. <laughs> should so be, no more waxing. So this is no more waxing. No more waxing, Steve. I don't believe it. So no more waxing. Yeah, completely different regime. Like it really? completely changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the whole idea once you kind of once you do a paint correction and then you do a coating. The whole new way of it, which kind of makes sense when you think about it, is you do as little as you can to touch the paint. So you don't want to be kind of getting like a little foam pad out and putting, dipping it in your pot of wax and all of that sort of Damn. stuff. You want to basically try not to touch your paint. Okay. So I'm going to have to relearn. It's going to be difficult for me. I like waxing. Kind of. I like yeah, waxing I do too. But I think um, there's a different way of kind of doing it. So I don't know. Look, um, I haven't... Um, my car's still curing as such and it's been yeah. raining this week and all that, plus I'm busy, so I haven't driven it since I've um, kind of finished the um, coat. How many days do you have to leave it for? A week? Um, cure properly, I think they said it was about five days. Okay. Um, so you're not supposed to kind of get it wet for like, you know, as long as I think about a week or two if you can. Right, um, right. Hey, let's talk about – let's talk about – um. Yeah. I don't know. We're running out of time, but let's talk about. No, no, just, keep going. just keep going. Just keep going. Cool. Yep. Um, so that that article that I sent you last night, that I came across last night, and we've talked about this before. We're going to get into transmissions in a second, but that, the article that I sent you about, yep. where it was basically time to limit your options. You know what I mean? We're all looking. You know, when you look at a new car, or you look at, and not not so much used cars. When you're specking a new car, isn't it? You know, do you really need all the options? Do you really need a seven one eight? Specked out to the max. Do you need your 992 Carrera to be a GTS with every single option ticked? 
or you know is it just as much the same experience by getting just a base career with with you know a couple of options um and i think this article was more about the 914 and 718 experience wasn't it steve yeah, I didn't – like I read the thing, but I thought you were sending it to me for – there's a car affection kind of video where um, the guy who I'd never seen before um, was reviewing a base 718 um, Boxster, like a, a racing yellow one, and he had a 914 um, – I think it's a 914.6 um, to kind yeah. of compare it to. Yeah. Um, and I think part of the point was just like, uh, you know, like it was a basic, it was the basic kind of model car, like, you know, not a GTS, not an S, blah, 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 um, very few options. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, I was only halfway kind of watching it um, before you kind of jumped on. So Yeah, I didn't watch the video. I just read the article. But basically, like you said, it was mm. about how to enjoy, and this is my memory here, basically enjoying the essence. Let me try and find the article while I'm talking. But it was basically trying to find the, to enjoy the essence of Porsche, right? And we're all after new experiences. We've spoken about it. You know, I spoke about it last week. We speak about it all the time. Um, and is there a valid argument to only get a few options on a on a new 911 or 718 or whatever Porsche you're buying? Um, you know, and I think what that article was doing, and like you said, it was based on the video, is they were comparing a yellow 718 Cayman to a yellow 914, both being mid-engined. You know, basically the 914 is, is you know, the the original classic version of the 718. I think that's what they were sort of trying to do as well. Um, and the experience you get out of a out of a car, out of a modern car, if you don't really go full on spec, you know, mm -hmm. that you still get the essence of Porsche and you get more of a classic experience. I think that's what, this is how I read it. This is what they were trying to oh, say. Oh, a classic experience? Yeah, okay. you know what I mean? Like you don't really yeah. need to have, you know, you could get a base career, you could get a 992, 911, you could get it with manual and maybe you get the exhaust and that's it. And maybe you don't need anything else. You know, you don't need the deviator stitching. You don't need anything because what you're getting is just a pure, you're still getting the essence of Porsche. You're getting the essence of the 911 or whatever it is, but you're just getting yep, a more yep. pure experience because you don't really need, you know, all the other stuff really. Do you really need it? And you know what I mean? Like you have a 911, you know, I know an owner's story. Is always ask, I always ask what options. I think we're, we're, we're I think we're pushed into thinking we need more options than we do. Do you know what I mean? Well, they make more margin. Like Porsche as a company make a lot more margin against like once you start ticking boxes, that's when they start making more money on it. Exactly, so. exactly. Um, but, you know, like, I don't know. I think it's a, it's a rethinking, isn't it? It's a rethinking. You know, it's that stripped back. I mean, look at electric cars, right? Electric cars have stuff, but all that stuff is in a screen. You know what I mean? Everything's there and it's all packed in. Yep. But as a as a looking at the car, it's very back to basics, um, you know. But if you I'm kind of talk about, say, like a 911 for a second, like a 99, call it a 992, um, I don't know much about it. I've actually never driven one. Um, but, you know, like when, when you start reading articles, like they kind of talk about how um, rear wheel steer, for example, is almost like a must on a 992 because it sort of, you know, increases the agility at speed and makes it easier to park because it's such a big car and all of that sort of stuff. Right. Like there's sort of so much more tech in in a newer car. So which yeah, you bits can't. do you kind of strip back, do you think? Like it's no, different but... when you're talking about, if you're talking a 964 or even like our cars kind of thing, there weren't that many kind of options on it, but. But I think that's it, though. Even if you buy the, mm. the new 911, the 992 911, in its pure basic form, you buy a Carrera, you just get manual, you just get sport. It's got so much more tech. It's got so much tech in there already. Do you know what I mean? It's got things mm -hmm. in there already. Like I said, how much do you need anymore? You know what I mean? It doesn't really make it. And it's not bare bones anymore, let's be honest. You know, our 997, if it yeah. was not spec'd out, was pretty much bare bones. You know what I mean? My car's yeah. pretty much bare bones. But I think the yeah. whole article was that, you know, if, it's, if you don't get so hung up on the options... Um, it still doesn't really take away from the experience. That's how I read it. You know what I mean? Um, that's how I kind of read into it. Um, I think it does from the driving experience, like definitely like in a 997. I mean, um, in terms of like when you think about kind of mechanical type options, there wasn't, there, there was no such thing as torque vectoring. There's no such yeah. thing as, you know, rear wheel steer and all that type of stuff. Um, so pure driving thrills when you kind of go down a twisty road and stuff like that, nah makes kind of bugger all difference right 
from an ownership point of view, like as an object and all that sort of stuff. Um, I don't know, like throw it back to you because your car was relatively, you know, sort of basic spec, but you often or sometimes kind of say, you know, like you wish that it had, you know, like the Xenon lights kind of thing. Or... That's what I was going to say. That's for me, yeah. for me, if I was, if I was buying a 992, right. Um, yeah. You know, the GTS, of course the GTS is, is appealing. They're saying the GTS is a stripped back GT3 or whatever. Now the new GTS and the GTS is amazing and sure. But if you yeah. have limited funds and you still, I want a new 992, I can't afford an S or a GTS, you know, yeah. it's, you shouldn't be like walk away from it because you can't afford that. You should still look at the oh, base. No, no. And I, I would have to yeah. say, I would still invest. That was, that were the three things I would invest in Steve. Actually, you, you, you spot on there. I would get manual. I would get sports exhaust and I would get the better lights. And for me, if there was three options, I don't know about for you, but for me, for three options on that new 992, and I've gone through the configurator a few times, that would probably be it. <laughs> um, I would right. probably even forego the, the multi-seat, adjustment even though this mg that i'm driving here in bahrain the same mg i've got back again um yeah the the effing (laughs) effing seat adjustment on that car it's got no lumbar support it's all manual i can't get it in any position that is actually comfortable for me and i think god that you know my my 15 year old 911 has better seat adjustment than this car you know what i mean like it's just okay you know my because it doesn't have any adjustment it's just got manual. It's all manual. And then I can't get it low enough and I can't get the seat on the right. There's no lumbar uh, support. And it's like, oh, my God, how could you have a car in this day It's probably poorly designed from the beginning, though. Like, I think yeah. that's one of the things that Porsche is really good at, too, like just basic. <laughs> they get the basics seat. right. So, like, yeah, like, you know, the seating position in terms of <laughs> the distance from the seat yeah. to the steering wheel and all that sort of stuff. Like, it's all kind of very thoroughly sort of thought out, but. So I'm saying, Steve, you don't need many options. I'm adding another option, actually. I think that the most important yeah. option, see we go, sports exhaust. You want the sports exhaust, right, because you want the sound. You want manual. You want the better lights. And you want yeah. the seat that gives you, if you're not in a GT3, just in a normal career, you want the, the seat that gives you enough adjustment. So whatever seat that may be, enough support and enough, enough adjustment. So I think they're the four key options for me if you're going to spec out a, a 911. <laughs> I'm already, you probably already added 15 grand to the cost already. So there you go. More than that. Yeah, probably more than that. I don't know. uh, I've never been in that sort of situation of having to kind of order a new car and like even on your own stories, things like, um, sounds like majority of people are buying kind of used ones, but the people that do go out and are fortunate enough to kind of spec a new one kind of go, well, there's actually nothing like specking out your car from scratch, Um, you know, never been in that position so i have no idea um but i'd i'd imagine it is quite satisfying but i'd also imagine that like if you've kind of got the money to go and do that and you walk into a dealership i bet you you've got a salesperson or i bet you there's like a billion like um forum posts that tell you that you need to kind of spec certain things to retain the value of it yeah, so exactly like trying to be disciplined and keep that out of your brain sort of going on well, like because i personally kind of go like Ideally, you'd want to sort of spec the car to your own taste and kind of fuck the person that's going to buy it next. You're not you're not bu- you're not specking it out for the per- the next owner kind of thing. But um, I guess you have to sort of be sort of fairly uh, affluent to have that type of um, mentality because clearly you do want you do want to sort of knowingly kind of um, keep the value of your car as as well as possible. I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Um, Tiptronic. Everyone, mm. well, most people don't like Tiptronic. Um, that article you sent me was quite, that forum article. It was Porsche Forum Australia, was it? Porsche Forum Australia, yeah, wasn't it? Was. it? Yeah, yeah. It was. I think it was interesting. Some dude posted on there, yeah, like, um, what was he in the market for? Obviously, it was an author's opinion, the author of the post. I yeah. don't know how long ago it was. And it was basically like, is Tiptronic really that bad? And I know that... There have been people in owner stories who have had Tiptronics and they're saying that they're not as bad as what people make out and you can still get a bit out of them and they're still fun when you're in the twisties. Um, yep. And I know there has been people, and I think Andrew from 911 South, 911 South was one of them when he had his, had his Tiptronic. Um, yep. I mean, that article that you sent was quite interesting because the guy's going that maintenance costs are cheaper, the Tiptronic's more reliable yep. than, than having yep. to change the clutch and 
yep. or everything else on a on a on a manual. And then that one, the interesting part about it, that article was that he said, you know, the Tiptronic on a nine nine six is a, is a five speed, and on the nine nine three is a four speed, right? Yep. Um, yep. You need to learn to drive a Tiptronic. I'm, I'm actually quoting the author here. You need to learn yeah. to drive a Tiptronic properly, and it will reward you. I thought that was interesting. You need to learn to drive it properly. And I think that's exactly what Andrew from 911 South told me. Andrew, I know you're listening, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what same. you told me. Did he say the same? And there, yeah, are a range so of tweak, there are a range of tricks. And let me just read this to the listeners, Steve. There are a range of tricks and tweaks described in the literature. Now, and I thought it was interesting that he said, I'm just going to re- quote these things, and I just want your opinion on it. He says, the tip is pretty much, the tip is pretty much a learn to use and forget gearbox, right? Yeah. He says the long service intervals are pretty unbreakable, right? Great for traffic yep. and learnable, learnable for the winding roads, which I thought was an interesting choice of words. And he says yep. on the turbo, on the 996 turbo, and I know Marco will be listening to this, on the, 99, on the turbo, when he's talking about the 996 turbo, the five speed yep. is a perfect match with its huge torque. Um, and he said the last two... Turbo buyers, I've helped find their cars. He must be a dealer, this guy that did, the, did this post. I, I didn't know who he was. He says, the last yep. two turbo buyers have helped find their cars only wanted Tiptronics. And he says that the, the 2011 PDK box in a box to S wasn't as smooth mm-hmm. as the Tiptronic. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, and then he says, but then he says, you know, the caveat, of course, that doesn't mean I don't love old fashioned analog experience of the manual 3.2 Carrera, but it is then nice to swap into the all wheel drive tip turbo to just enjoy the smooth, high power delivery and grip. Have we been overlooking Tiptronics and all of us in, in all of us, basically, because we love manuals? Have in we been opinion? overlooking the tip and is it better than what we thought? Mm. I don't mean to offend anybody because I know like you've had tons of people that have gone tips great, but it's not for me. I, I know that much. Like um, when I had my 993, my uncle, who I've spoken about a million times over, had the identical Aventura um, 993, like the non-Vario RAM. So I had the manual, he had the tip and I really didn't enjoy driving his car. Like, and I had a direct comparison point, obviously, because I had my car. It, albeit my car was tweaked, like his was bog standard. Like I had coilovers, exhaust, blah, 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 blah. But I just couldn't, I couldn't and I still can't kind of quite see why beyond like you need an automatic car for your better half to kind of go and drive um, as well to share. Um yeah, I just never found it. Like, I just sort of found it really slow and slushy, and it just took it took a lot of the um, the sort of involvement away from it. So I I couldn't kind of quite get it. And whenever I've driven a sort of uh, you know, like back in those days too, like if you kind of get a courtesy car from Porsche or whatever else, or like you'd kind of drive. Like if occasionally Auto House would kind of give me like one to drive as well, and it wound up being a tip. It's just like. Yeah, look, you know, it probably is great in traffic if you're kind of doing the slog in peak hour traffic and stuff like that. But okay. I wouldn't really be driving a car, uh, a Porsche, a sports car in traffic if I could help it for that kind of reason. Okay. So, so you've had the, the back-to-back comparison almost. You had exactly the same car, base Carrera, 993, one in tip, one in manual, yep. right? Yep, yep. Do you think then that this what this author in this post is talking about is he's talking about the turbo. Do you think that the, the problem with the Tiptronic tr- transmission isn't the Tiptronic transmission? It's, it is well more suited to a car that does have higher power, that does have a whole lot of torque like the turbo. And that's what he's comparing it to because he's talking about the turbo in Tiptronic. Yeah. And you think it works like, better. And people say that PDK, right? PDK obviously in GT2 RSs and stuff, you know, is better. And that's why it's in, in PDK. It's not in manual. Yeah, like... Because I was about to kind of flick it over to PDK conversation as well. So, sorry, like the beginning part of this conversation was Tiptronic, not PDK. Um, you know, like, so it's an old school, like, torque converter kind of gearbox, um, very sort of slow to respond, all of that sort of stuff. Yes, you can sort of select your gears um, sequentially, but um, it's not like um, pre selected kind of dual clutch. Um, so, my wife's um, McCann, like, McCann Turbo has a PDK in it, and I still don't enjoy that as well. I just, um, it feels kind of slow off the line 
um, even if you've kind of got it in sports mode and stuff like that. And so this is sort of, sorry, more a reflection of me. Like I think I'm just sort of like a diehard kind of manual guy um, and I don't really enjoy, I know that the PDK box is kind of good, but I, I still don't really enjoy it in the McCann as well. So the McCann is a 2000 what model year again? 2015. Have they improved that PDK box a lot since 2015? Um, sure, they probably would have. Like in terms of um, uh, a lot of it's sort of software kind of programming. Like I've driven my uncle's 991.2 as a PDK as well. When I drove that, like it felt, you know, it felt more responsive, but, you know, like um, you still just don't get the same sort of kind of control and the satisfaction of obviously kind of shifting a gear and all that type of stuff yourself. Um, it's, it's clearly more efficient, but it, uh, in what you gain in efficiency, and I'm sure like if you're going around a track, hence like a 991.2 GD3 or whatever, yeah. an R, sorry, an RS, yeah. the reason why they make RS is because you can't physically kind of shift as quick as, um, you know, like a PDK gearbox. So yes. you're nailing track time, but I just don't find it as engaging. I mean, usually, have you driven a tip? No, I haven't. Usually, these posts I wouldn't take much notice of, but I thought it was a good one yeah. when you. And I only literally looked at it last night. I only had a chance to look at it last night, and I thought it was interesting okay. from this author, yeah. Steve, is because he yeah. does have the eighty-eight manual Carrera, and he has yeah. a five-speed Tiptronic on his nine-nine-six turbo. So I thought it was yeah. quite good that he, you know, he has the experience with the with an old-school manual analog. Um, yep. Yeah. You know, and of course he makes the thing about, you know, the, the, the clutch being expensive with slave cylinder changes and, you know, doing it sure. every 30 to 40K. But I'd like to know from people that have Tiptronics about this, you know, learn to use and forget. What do you have to learn about the Tiptronic to get the most out of it? I mean, is there something we're missing? You know what I mean? Because he's, he, it says be... it, he says it twice, great for traffic and learnable for winding grounds. Now, what, what the transmission is learning, you're, what are you learning about this, this, this gearbox which makes it so better. So wouldn't that be like, for example, you're going down a twisty road. So pretend we're hooning down like, you know, national, national park down south. And as you're approaching a corner, you're trying to work out whether or not you're in third or second. I'm assuming in a Tiptronic car, you've got to be, you've got to premeditate and think ahead a little bit more. And then if you decide that you want to shift down a cog, you've got to do it sort of well in advance of when you might do it in a manual car or a PDK car because the car is going to um, take a bit longer to actually kind of select the gear and then right. then engage it, um, then kind of give you the little bit of extra traction um, as you're kind of going around the corner. Like, because you don't want to sort of shift, you know, like halfway out the corner. I'm assuming that you're probably kind of wanting it to kind of um, change gear at a particular point. So wouldn't it be that a Tiptronic, transmission forces you to kind of think ahead more maybe see i think of automatics and i think of old automatics and i think yeah. of my brother driving them when i was a kid because my brothers are much older than me you know and yeah. my brother used to have a lot of company cars and i always remember an automatic and they'd always go back to there was one or two i think one or two yeah, gears, yeah, yeah. and they'd yeah. always just yeah. he'd always go back to get the more power and it was always you know, yeah. like very jerky and very like not smooth yeah. at all and that's my yeah. memory of automatics you know what i mean and maybe that's why i don't like automatics because i always remember that experience as a passenger as a kid um and these were all chrysler chrysler rangers and you know Holden Kings, Kingswood station wagons or whatever they were, like very Australian type cars all, at the time. Um, but I always remember that one and two thing, which was just didn't work. So I guess it's kind of the same thing, right? I still, yeah, I don't know. Like my uncle was saying to me on a text the other day, he's got like a C63 AMG, the first of the turbocharged ones. So I, I don't know like the kind of nomenclature for it, but um he was complaining to me that um, it had what he said was turbo lag. Um, oh, really? And, yeah, and I sort of said to him, do you reckon that's turbo lag or do you reckon that's um, more the um, gearbox? Right. Because, yeah, like, the, the McCann feels similar. Like, you know, the McCann, like, my wife's car is bloody powerful. Um, like, when it's rolling, I remember when we first got it and we went for that <laughs> trip to Mudgee. <laughs> Yeah, it's like six cylinder with twin turbo and stuff like that. Like similar feeling to my old 1M. Like if you're in gear on the freeway and you're already kind of going at like 100 and you want to get around somebody, 
you don't have to change down or anything. You just pretty much go straight past somebody because there's so much torque and turbo. Um, that's what the turbo kind of gives you. Right. Um, but like when you accelerate from a standing start, um, and this is how I kind of feel about the McCann or how I felt about like whenever I've driven Tiptronic cars, it just doesn't, it's never felt that responsive to right. me. Like it always sort of feels like there's a little bit of mm. is there delay. any Is there anything that can be done about that? Is there any anything that Porsche offers or any other, other third-party manufacturers offer that, that get rid of that? First, I don't know. First, it's like first gear lag, is it? It's like first gear, it's, it's, it's the um, ratio of the first gear or what is it? No, because in again, go back to the McCann, like on um, the PDK. Yeah. Um, if you put it in Sports Plus, so like it's obviously kind of a fairly kind of grunty car. If you put it in Sports or Sports Plus particularly, it means that it on a standing start, it will start you in first, not second. Right. Um, and it will rev all the way kind of close to redline, and then it will shift. Right. Um, so that sort of takes some of the. Um, kind of delay out that, I try, that I'm trying to describe, but very kind of poorly. Um, so it does would, kind of go some of the way, but... Okay. So you would leave it in Sports Plus all the time then? Because that's that button that's, that's in 991, no. so people say 991 PDK is the best yeah. if they got that extra Sports Plus. You wouldn't leave it yeah, in Sports yeah. Plus all the time then? I, tr- I tried it. When, I, when we first got the McCann, I was driving around in Sports Plus, but it's like, no, nah, it's just too aggressive because, you know, like... <laughs> You don't want to be driving to Redline pretty much every, <laughs> like, you know, like you look like a complete idiot kind of driving to the shops, kind of buzzing the Redline the whole time. So, what is this? What is um, the 0 to 100 of that McCann Turbo? Just for no interest sake, do you know? Is it, it, actually is it know. under four seconds? No, I don't think it'd be. It's that like 4.3 4. or something. It's too it must, heavy. It's under five. Just it must be talking and I'll look it up. It must be. I'd like to know what that is. So we're talking about transmissions. Okay. So the tip argument. Um, I know that everyone's just like everyone's talking into their uh, into their phone at the moment and, and adding their opinion like they do talking into the radio, as so to speak. But um, 4. it's an interesting. Four point five seconds. Four point five seconds. See, that's that's pretty fast. But then for a turbo, it's not that fast, is it? Uh no. It's a big car. It's still a big, Heavy. kind of weighty kind of car. Yeah, and. Um, I still, well, slightly different conversation. Like, um, that's still slower than technically to the GT3, but like it's bigger. What's your GT3? And stuff like that. GT3 not to 4.3. So it's close though. It's close. What yeah. would win the drag? Well, it's faster than my car. The, the Macan's much faster than mine. Mine's five seconds. Uh, it's, okay. So like if I was, if I could duplicate myself, like my doppelganger and I are sort of standing sitting next to each other, I'm in the GT3 and then the other one of me is sitting in the McCann and I had a drag race, the McCann will be quicker because I won't be able to shift as quickly in my GT3 and I won't. I don't yeah, have the skill yeah. to kind of get it to 100 like that. I'd probably have to dump the clutch to get that sort of number yeah. out of it. And Whereas the McCann, clutch. all I have to do is kind of stick it in Sports Plus and then floor it. Yeah, lazy. Yeah. L- lazy driver. Um, speaking about that dumping your clutch, um, clutch yeah. feel. That other article you sent me, another it was a Renless forum, I think, wasn't it? On Renless, yeah, I'm looking at it now. Uh, yeah. So the clutch, yeah, the yeah. 991 GT3, the 991 GT3, and I have to say, and I know all the listeners are going to go crazy, but I've, you know, I, I keep going on different tangents with what I want. Okay. Mm. <laughs> but the 991 I've known point, you for a long time, and that's <laughs> the 991. <laughs> that's <not> news. <laughs> the 991.2 GT3 is very appealing to me. It's very appealing yep. to me, and and. I've always been a big fan of crayon chalk color. I know you're not a big fan of it. And that one in Victoria, no, like and I the just, one in Victoria that's for sale for 369000 the manual GT3 in crayon chalk, um, I showed it yep. to my wife, Natasha, the other day, and I said, if I, if I, could, if I could push it and do this, it would be, it would be fantastic. But unfortunately, what it's just, where are we getting the money from? <laughs> Silver 997, I keep saying it to you. Yeah, I sell the 997 for 120. This is three yep. three eighty. Say when it's on, probably more than three eighty when you add stamp duty on. You know, you yep. still got two hundred and seventy thousand odd Australian dollars to add to it. Uh, Money well spent, I'd say. Yeah, but you know, we just bought an apartment this year, so it's like it's probably not being the most sensible thing in the world. See, this is a problem. If we hadn't yep. had to buy that apartment and we could have sold it, then it wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have been a problem. But yep. everyone talks about that. 991.2 GT3 manual transmission, Steve, in the GT3 being the yep. best manual transmission. Um, 
I don't yep. know whether it's in a GT3 or it's just overall out of every 911 that they've driven over the last few generations is the best one. Um, and they say it's better than the 997. Um, what is it about the 997 that, that people criticise? It's a, it's, it's a heavy clutch, is it? Do you think it's heavy? Uh, so I've never driven the 991 GT3. I'd like to. Um, Go on, test I've kind of always been a, yeah, I've always been a little bit scared because I always sort of wondered whether or not um, – like to take my own advice whether or not it would make me discontent about my own car. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you kind of go and drive a 991.2, it's like, oh, you well, know what like you should do? so much better. I want one no, of these instead. Like, no, go with your uncle. Go to Porsche Willoughby or Porsche Sydney, Sydney, in Sydney and see if they've got one in stock and just get your uncle to test drive it and then you can have a go. Yeah, I've done it before. Like when I was in the 993, I went for a test drive with a mate who, um, you know, sort of signed a book deal and um, we kind of went to Scuds and jumped into a 997. Um, and I actually do remember kind of coming away from that. I didn't want to sort of shit all over the car that he sort of really wanted to get, but I sort of thought, oh, I actually think I prefer my 993 to this 997. Um, so it could be the same. Like I don't think automatically if you go and test drive the the newer car that you're automatically going to hanker for it. But um, so, sorry, I've never driven a 991 GT3. I would like to, but just again, when you read some of these sorts of posts, um, it seems like it's a much lighter kind of um, clutch and gearbox sort of feel, mm. um, which sounds like it, it, it's quite different from um, like a 997 sort of transmission. And <sighs> yeah. I don't know, like some, uh, when you read this kind of post, there are people that kind of go, yeah, yeah, it's much nicer because it's lighter and it sort of feels just as accurate, blah, blah, blah. And there are some that sort of say like a 997 um, gear shift and the clutch, the clutch is like, it, it, it is quite heavy. Like you've driven my car. I um, didn't think it was that heavy. I'm trying to think back. I actually didn't think it was that heavy. You know what I mean? I know it's you heavy. told me that. I, I reckon it is, yeah. <clears throat> but I think it's the way you've set up your shifter which takes away from it. I don't think you notice it. Uh, I think okay. it's like a really the touch. short I think it's a really short clicky throw that you have in your car that I don't think you I don't think I really noticed the clutch being heavy. Maybe I need to drive it again to yeah. see, but I don't think it was heavy. And I know this article you sent me, they're saying that the that you know the nine oh one is lighter. And I'm guessing they're saying 991.2, right? Like much lighter. Much yes. lighter. Um, yep. But is that what makes the 997 more unique? Is that what makes the 997 yeah. more sought after? You know, because it is, and you, what I think you said, it makes it, does it make it rawer? You know, is this that raw experience? More mechanical. More mechanical. Yeah. Um, and yep. didn't you tell me, and I don't know the ins and outs of this, didn't you tell me between a 997.1 yep. GT3 and a 997.2 GT3, didn't you tell me there was some difference in the clutch in the two models or something? That mm. There was a different feel? That I thought you me. said there was something different about the feel of it, no? In the clutch? I don't think so. Wasn't the clutch? Like, okay, maybe I'm mis mis no. misremembering. Because I was, was going to say, like, the thing about when you drove my car is that you've got to try to separate the gear shift feel and the clutch pedal feel. Um, like, I remember the first time I drove a 997 GT3, one thing I did notice was like, oh, wow, like the clutch is heavy. And this is like after I'd been driving a 993 for 12 years and a 964 yeah. prior to that. Yeah. Um, so when you jump into a 997 GT3, like I do reckon like you feel like the clutch is quite, quite, quite heavy. Um, and then hence like when you kind of jump on forums again, like a lot of people kind of go, oh, you can't drive one in traffic. You know, you can't, you can't daily a 997 GT3, which I don't actually agree with because – like I've done it and I'm not the kind oh. of strongest, beefiest person on the planet. Like, um, but once you get used to it, it's fine. You know, when I drive up the coast from Sydney, when I go up to my family's, you know, which, yeah. as you know, it's only an hour and a half away from Sydney. And when I come yep. back to Sydney and I'm coming back, if it's on a effing Sunday, right? And yep. then the traffic yep. coming back into Sydney oh, is stuck heavy. On the freeway? And I get yep. stuck in the yep. traffic at the end of the freeway into Chatswood there. Yep. And, you know, my leg is hurting by the time I get back to, my, to the apartment. Like I find my, because I'm continually oh, really? like changing, I find the clutch like, that's when I find it, I find it unenjoyable. I, I really don't like that bit when I'm stuck. You know what I mean? I don't mind when I'm moving a bit, when you're just completely stuck yep. and you're just crawling, I find it really, yep. really tiresome, really, really tiresome. When you're in that mode of you kind of have to creep a tiny bit in traffic, yeah. so you're slightly 
just yeah, sort you, of finding biting point and then you yeah, have to kind of dip you the trying, clutch again. And yeah, and you're trying stuff. to protect your clutch and you just got to keep, you know, and it's just like, oh, maybe it's more boring than, than hard to change, but I just find it, it's just not well, a good experience. So if you feel like that, like, because um, I have driven your car a couple of times, like I'd imagine, I'm, I'm guessing that the weighting of a 991 GT3 clutch is probably more similar to the weighting of your car. Um, which isn't as heavy, like nearly as heavy as a nine nine uh, as a GT three. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I saw that other thing you put. You know, the nine nine seven point one gear shift bit about being horrible and notchy. That was just about a standard nine nine seven point one, was it, or was that more about the GT three? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, a bog standard nine nine seven GT three in terms of like not the clutch, um, the gear shift feel. Um, it's quite polarizing again. Um, sorry, this might be a bit boffany for people that aren't. GT3. Like, um, GT3 we're still talking about. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the standard one I find really notchy and plastic. I didn't really enjoy it. That's kind of why I shifted. Um, I kind of had the um, numeric kind of put in. Like I was looking for, I was looking for ways of kind of improving that like very quickly from once I kind of got the car. Um, so. Um, but again, like, you know, you start reading, um, that particular kind of, um, thread and like some people kind of rave about it and go, yeah, yeah. Like it's one of the best shifts ever. I, was like, well, I didn't, I didn't see that at all. Mm. I always sort of found it to be a bit clunky. But I also read, I've read those forums too. When people change to numeric, yeah. people say how much better it is. You know what I mean? And the numeric being yeah. quite adjustable. And especially when you go full, most people go full numeric, don't they? With cables and everything, the cables make it even more uh, sort of, I don't know. Do yeah. you go cables as well? I did. I did. Yeah. But that makes it more racy though, doesn't it? The cables make a difference. I'm not sure what the difference is, but I have basically. It kind of basically it. increases all the kind of accuracy. Like, you know, if you sort of sit in traffic and you're sitting there and the, the shifter is in neutral and you try to kind of, you know how like if you're just kind of bored, you can wobble the kind of gear stick around? Yes. Um, the more and more... Uh, upgraded your gearbox is like from like the G a standard gd3 then to a numeric then to kind of cables and stuff like that to me the difference is there's no slack in it you can't actually kind of right. wobble the thing around right. like right. You know, it literally only has it's precise a certain becomes kind of, precise yeah. though, doesn't it that's what it is um yeah. and you know everyone knows the story when i've got the you know just the short shift the short shifter kit for my 997 and you know you I was saying, like it, right? and then i was saying to you i was complaining saying oh fuck it it's no different there's no different, yep. remember? And then yep. I think I came to your place and we went to that car show and you drove it for a second, yep. didn't you? And you said, no, it feels different. I think you said it felt different. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. And I think my problem was is that I had just recently been in your car and I think I expected it to be, you know, different. More like that. Yeah. More like yours and yep. it wasn't. And I think that was the problem with me. And I think now, I think now when I, and I, and I really, I haven't driven it that much with the short shifter. This is the other problem. I really haven't driven it that much. Um, I think it is actually better. I think it is better because the other one was very loose. This is a little bit tighter. It's a little bit more mechanical for anyone that's yep. thinking of upgrading to it, but it's not as mechanical, obviously, as a numeric. If you want something really precise and, and more mechanical, then something like a numeric is obviously a lot better than, than just getting the Porsche part, the short shifter kit. Yeah, I think it's got its downsides too because it really is very specific. Like I still remember your reaction to it and I remember kind of trying to prep you for it, which is, you know, like – in all my kind of previous cars, I'd always kind of messed with like short, short shift kits in like the 993, the 964, the 1M, like pretty much every car I've ever owned, I've always kind of put short shift kits in it. But this numeric, um, this numeric shifter is very, very kind of tight and very kind of clicky and stuff like that. It's something you kind of have to learn a little bit. Like it's, yeah, it's a different not level. the sort of, yeah, it's not the sort of car where you can kind of just jump in and then kind of who no. off. Like it um, confused me. I told you it confused me. Yeah, it was confusing at you first. Lose like, where... You can't see where your gear. You, you, you look down and it confuses you because you're used to seeing it in a certain position as well. If you do look down, but it's just finding the gear at first. I'm sure you get used well, to it very it feels, quickly. Feels. Yeah, it just sort of feels like um, you're a bit more uncertain as to whether you're in first or third or fifth kind of thing because yes. they just sort of feel stacked closer together, even though, like, obviously the physical distance is the same and all that type of thing. Yep. Um, 
Interesting. Oh, yeah, I don't know. On. It's a long. It's a long debate. We could talk about it for for weeks ahead. That's for sure. And I'm sure everyone think, who's listening have got their opinion about uh, Tiptronics and short shifter kits and numerics and everything like that. And also about the base, uh, the 997 GT3 um, clutch feel and gear feel. Steve, I'm sure there's a lot of people. I think that like an interesting it. thing too would be um, when you make it back um, comparing your shift feel to Marco's. Yeah, that would be. Interesting. I think his. I think his car's got a short shifter in it as well. So, right, I don't, and I'm, right. because um, he has no idea of exactly what kind of mods and who, like exactly kind of which company they kind of come from and stuff like yep. that. Um, yep. But his car, I think, is definitely not standard. So, it'd be interesting to see how um, your cars compare. Yeah, it will be. Marco sent me an image yesterday, I think it was. Um, hi, Marco. He sent me an image of his Alcantara that he's added to his car. Looks cool. Looks good, doesn't it? Yeah, it looks good. Looks good. And also, Marco, uh, I've mentioned before in the other podcast, he's uh, ordered the the knob for us. I've gone in. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's done the order for the LaveWorks knob. Did Did Marco tell you that the Chris has actually shortened the um, shortened the rod now? It's actually actually shorter. Oh, as a standard thing. Apparently, that's what Marco said. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. Apparently. But you guys are sort of pretty much specking something similar to what uh, I had done. I got the same as yours. It's already placed the order. Um, I, yeah. I placed, it's placed, Marco placed the order. He went backwards and forwards a few times. I know Nick in yeah, the UK. Hi, Nick. Uh, Nick, who is on Owner hey, Stories Nick. number one. Um, Nick Did is Nick also, he's going to get one. Yeah, I, I basically pasted and copied my specs and sent it to him the other day. Um, from what Marco okay. had sent me, and I think he's just going to order the same thing. I said just double check with him first. So that it's exactly the same yeah, right. for a 4S or a whatever, but uh, I think he's going to get the same. But I, I'm interested to see how it feels. I'm interested to see how it feels. I mean, I think, you know, I'll, um, I'll go back Chris... to Sydney. I've, I've got all these leather parts and all these things. I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to install everything I bought. I'm still thinking about it because I'm ah, still thinking about why wouldn't you? Because I'm still thinking about what I'm going to do with the car. I haven't actually completely decided right. yet. I've got a lot of, I've got a few ideas in my heads about different things, so I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. But I think I probably Roof will. Box. Like I said, I, 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 I'm not a. I mean, hopefully by January things will be a little bit different, and hopefully there'll be more options. So we'll see what happens, mate. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, um, I was going to say, oh, just on just before on the shifter things before yep. we go, my recommendation for this week. Yep. Um, well, I know we've missed it a couple of times, but um, I have nothing. I so just had, yours. That's all right. I just had my uh, shift rod from Lathworks ceramic coated by Cerakote in Sydney. Um, dude, they're called Simon. Um, uh, sort of did the so it came as um, brushed stainless, which doesn't work for my interior, and I wanted it to be kind of matte black, so I had it ceramic coated. Picked it up and it looks awesome. I just sent you a photo of it, actually. Okay. Is that expensive? Nope. Super cheap. So people in Australia, people in Sydney, what's the guy's name? Simon at Cerakote, C-E-R-A-K-O-T-E. Um, for example, if you wanted your exhaust tips or your exhaust kind of ceramic coated and stuff like that. Um, okay. They're the, they're the guys to go to. I did it for um, cosmetic reasons, not um, heat how did you find? Uh, how did you find them? Served me up. So got served up on Instagram again. <laughs> oh, really? Instagram? Don't you love Instagram? Yeah. Makes you spend money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the scary thing. It makes um, you spend money. Yeah. All right. So it, it was good. Um, highly recommend it. I'll look forward to seeing it. Where'd you send it to me by email? No uh, text. Sent sent you text this morning. Oh, okay. You got it in. Um, can I share that image with uh, Nick? Yeah, sure. Because he wanted to see your shifter in situ. He wanted to see what it looked like because he's a bit worried about the length of it. And I said to him that it's um, changed. That looks cool. Oh, you mean the height? Yeah, the height. Yeah. That looks cool. Is it a better feel, the shifter, the lathe work shifter? Does it feel better than the one you had in before? (laughs) I haven't driven on it, mate. Or are we, you haven't driven? Or are we just being crazy and just wasting money for no reason? I think I'm going to take a wild guess that, like, for example, when you and Marco put it in your car, you will notice a difference in the feel more than me because my numeric shifter is so stiff and notchy and all that sort of sort of stuff that 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 kind of dominates everything. Whereas with your cars, where the the shift feels a little bit lighter, the actual kind of rod and the ball and all that sort of stuff is like a lot heavier than the standard plastic ones. So I think it will make a difference to the way that it feels when you drive it. Well, so it'll feel lighter, on, you think? No, I think it'll feel more direct. 
more I direct. think you'll kind of feel like more, literal more weight in it because it is like substantially kind of heavier. Oh, it's heavier. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like that rod is like, um, you know, pure sort of stainless steel. It's oh, kind of machined out of stainless steel. I thought it was light. So it's heavier. Do you want it yeah, to no, be no, heavier? It's heavier. Way but then heavier. the car will be slower because the car will be heavier then. I'm trying to lose weight. Well, remember? That's a problem for you. <laughs> Luckily, I've <laughs> lost weight, so it'd be okay. Um, yeah, right. Mate, what else? Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say, and I didn't talk mm. about it. I think that's about it. I've got to go for a shot. To, I've got to go for a test today, 10 day test. Why? Because in Bahrain, we have to have a five day test and a 10 day test. So I'm about to go for a 10 day test. Um, oh, okay. I like to finish. How, was, it? How was traveling? And um, did it feel a bit confronting again to kind of go to Dubai or? Uh, Dubai was like, people are wearing masks, but apart from that, forget about any other social distancing. Even Expo, you know, World Expo, which is what we went there for, it's supposed to be all about social dodge. distancing. Honestly, the crowds, it's like, no, nah, there's no, it doesn't, you're wearing a mask, that's it. You know what I mean? And you've got to show you right. visitors, some visitors had to show their vaccination. Um, but that's what happened to me the other day because we didn't start on COVID talk, so let's end on it. Um, yep. I've got, we got an app in Bahrain, it's called the Be Aware app, and it shows us that we're yep. vaccinated, we have a badge, and it's all very, yep. very high tech, you know, they do it really, really well. The other day, yep. it changed, the color changed, it says, vaccination, you are, uh, vaccination status expired or something. I was like, what? what? What's going on? What and this is mean? a problem, I don't know, it's a problem if we're traveling to London and Australia, right? Because it yep. says you're not vaccinated. Well, you're vaccinated, but it's expired. It just meant you had yep. to have a booster shot, so we had to have a booster shot because it's oh, been okay. six months and they're only doing booster oh, okay. shots for like elderly or high risk people. But now they've done all those yep. people. They're just doing it for everyone else. So literally okay. we got the thing that afternoon, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. We did it on the app to get an appointment that yep. night. The appointment came through for the next day. That's how right. efficient it is. That's how quick it is. We went to a different hospital. The hospital wasn't as good as the first one we went to. So had a booster right. shot, but Natasha had um, bad side effects from it. She's had like, it's oh, like no. lymph nodes get all swollen and stuff. So she's actually been a bit oh. rough. But um, which, which one did she have? Pfizer. We're on Pfizer. Right. Okay. So Pfizer booster. So now I've had three shots of Pfizer. I was against it. I'll be honest. Um, no, Ajmal, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, but I was against having. <laughs> I was against having three another shot. I don't think I need another shot. But apparently the the strength of Pfizer apparently reduces a lot after six months yeah right and the woman at the hospital this is an interesting fact for everyone um we all have to get used to these vac these jabs because apparently even though it's not really announced yet apparently the story is it's going to be like flu shot and you literally have to get it yearly you have to get every a booster year? yearly yeah. every year you're going to have to get a, a jab so there you go yeah right okay. mate i don't know sydney's finally kind of catching up um you know i've been talking to well, not so much i i was talking to my sister who is between London and Helsinki and she was literally sort of saying, yeah, like everybody um, in Europe is just sort of behaving like there is no COVID kind of thing. And um, she just sort of said, it's just something like it's a headspace thing, like a mentality that you just kind of have to get used to. Um, it's like, oh, okay. Like we're far from that at the moment because we're so like, as in myself and my family and everything, like we're so, conservative and cautious about like our approach kind of thing like i still i'm doing all my sort of grocery shopping online and stuff like that I'm yeah not, um, look the hardest and... the hardest thing and i think i don't think a lot of people have experienced this and the worst thing is this yep. mask mask wearing and mask yep. you know in, in dubai everyone's wearing a mask in dubai yep. it was 39 degrees most days oh, but geez. it was 39 yeah, okay. degrees that felt like 48 because the humidity right yep. So yeah. walking around Expo site and, and a lot of the walking we're doing, you realize how having a mask on your face for that many hours in a full day yeah. from like nine to nine at night is yeah. really awful. It's really, really yeah, awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, your skin feels bad. It's itchy. It's like hot. It's, it's not comfortable. In fact, you know, like, like when you're at home, it's okay, you know, but when you have to go out yeah. and you've got to wear that for long periods in extreme heat, honestly, yeah. mate, it's just, it's just torture. It really is torture. Yeah, it's I can like, imagine now. Yeah. Because even like if I'm uh, walking um, my daughter in the stroller and stuff and I'm sort of trying to walk quicker or whatever and there's been the odd hotter day in Sydney when I've kind of done that, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> now, then when you like that's not a 30-plus degree day, like I can't imagine what that would be like. Well, I, I kept joking to because Lucy, our writer from Scotland, came over and with Lucy yeah. and Natasha and I. And um, yeah. 
I was joking that we were going to get um, dog tan on our face. That way you get the thing with the mask because it's so hot and yeah, you're right. getting sunburned. You know when you get sunglasses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all going to have this like white thing around our face and everything else is going to be brown. It was you okay. It. it was okay. You look. All right, mate. Let's go. Cool. All right. Anything else? Nope. That's it for me. Thanks, Sorry, mate. Sorry, I've been a bit sort of missing no. or whatever, but I uh, can't good tell chat. you how weird everything's been, so. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second when we stop recording. Um, all right, everyone. I know everyone's glad to hear, hear your voice again, Steve. Glad for you to be back. Um, that people Thanks, do ask me these things. I don't always pass on the messages, but people do ask me if, you're, if everything's okay coming back. And I say, yes, he is. All right. Yep. Thanks, mate. Let's go. Cheers, mate. All right. See thanks. You. All right, everyone. Uh, that's Steve coming in from Sydney. My name's Michael Bath, and that's it for the Porsche Cool podcast for today. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. <laughs>